Time to start unit four. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so unit four, we're going to deal with geometry and measurement. And then there's going to be a little bit of basic statistics at the end of it. So we're going to start out talking about measurement. And measurement really came from a need to communicate. For example, if we're trying to, you know, for each trying to build something, and we want them to be the same. You know, if we're in the same room together building it, we can just walk over to each other, mark them off, make sure they're the same, and that's fine. But if we're across town or even just on the other side of the building, we need some way to communicate that size back and forth. I mean, you could always take a stick or a string and cut it that size and send it. Um, but it'd be nice to be able to just take a piece of paper and write it down and get several of them written down at once so that you could, you know, communicate those sizes. So if we had something like, let's say we got this sheet of paper here, and I take my pen and I measure it. I go one, two, my sheet of paper is two pens long. Well, if I take, send it to you, and you take your pen, and you go, okay, one, two, well, yours is significantly shorter than mine. Why was it shorter? Well, because the pen you were using was smaller than the one I had. So for measurement to work, two things had to happen with what you used to measure. One is both people who are communicating had to have one of those objects. And the second thing is they had to be at least really close to the same size. You know, they didn't have to be exactly the same, but if they were close, it would work. So what they started to use were common items, and for length, those items tended to be parts of the body. If we're looking at standard units, all right. Can anybody tell me what is the shortest unit of length we use in the standard system? The inch. The inch comes from, it is the distance from the end of your thumb to the point of that first knuckle. That is an inch. So you'd measure the sheet of paper. You go one, two, three, four, and you measure it up. That's where it came from, yeah. That's where it originated from. Now, there was very little variation in the size of the thumb. I mean, you got to remember, this was developed a couple thousand years ago where people, like I think a, the average man was like five foot three, so relatively short. So there's a le lot less variation in size back then. Um, <clears throat> you also notice as I was doing that, that motion of my thumb, that kind of almost like rocking as I rolled my thumb, that's where the, the inchworm got its name because it kind of has that same motion as it moves. Uh, anyway, bigger than an inch, we had what's the next step bigger than an inch? A foot. One foot is how many inches? Twelve inches. And a foot is just like it sounds, from the back of your heel to the tip of your big toe, or the tip of your longest toe, I should say. Not always your big toe. Um, that was a foot. Now. Your, you may not have 12 of your thumbs in your foot. It was in the 500s, King Edward declared that his thumb and his foot were going to be the official units of measure for his land. He wasn't the only ruler that did that, by the way. Other rulers did that for their regions as well. So the inch and the foot ended up being different from one country to another, even after they were standardized. Next, if I have a foot, if I were measuring the height of this wall next to me here, would I use an inch or would I use a foot? I would want to use a foot. It would take a lot of inches to get up there. But before King Edward standardized that, if I wanted to measure that in feet, I could get up to maybe here with some serious stretching. To get all the way up to the ceiling wasn't going to happen unless I chopped my foot off at the ankle. So to measure, the foot was only used for measuring things that were along the ground or near the ground because that's where feet are. To measure something 
up and down like that, we needed something else. They used hands. The hand was the, the width of your hand at the base of the fingers. It was about four inches. So you'd stack your hands up to measure heights like that. Um, livestock, sheep, cattle, horses are still measured in hands. Once King Edward, even though it was a very egotistical move for King Edward to say, hey, my thumb and my foot are going to be used by everybody, it freed us up because they went in and they took little blocks and they cut them the size of his thumb and the size of his foot and they copied them and spread them out for people to use. Well, now that we had this block, you could use that block to measure the height of the wall and feet. You didn't need hands anymore. Bigger than feet, there were other units that we don't use anymore. One of them was called a cubit. How many of you have ever heard of a cubit? Nobody? Um, it was actually a construction unit. It was from the tip of your longest finger to the point of your elbow. Now, mine's about 18 inches, but back then it was about 16. A cubit is 16 inches. And the thing, I mean, construction, everything is spaced 16 inches. Joists are spaced 16 inches. Studs are 16 inches. Rafters are 16 inches. So that's how carpenters laid out their job. They put their arm in there, and they, that's where they set the next one. Yeah. Why it was 16? Oh, sure. Yep. Yep. So again, once we standardized, once King Edward standardized those sides and we had blocks, but we didn't need to you know, lift your foot up there. You could actually mark it out in other units and not have to use the cubit anymore. The next one bigger that we actually use is the yard. A yard is how many feet? Three feet. Um, most people think of the yard as the length of a person's stride. And while that is approximately a yard, that's not where it came from. The yard is actually a tailor's unit. And is from your outstretched hand, either to the center of your chest or the tip of your nose. That's, you grab it, and that's one yard of fabric. You grab again, that's two yards, and so on. And of course, King Edward declared that his yard was going to be the official yard of the land. Um, now, I should point out, King Edward's foot did not have 12 of his thumbs in it, and his yard did not have three of his feet in it. A couple hundred years later, after he was dead, they decided to adjust those units so there was a conversion. Up until that point, if you measured something in feet and I measured something in inches, there was absolutely no way to compare to see which one was longer. There was no conversion between them. So they adjusted it. We, we would end up, what we'd end up doing is remeasuring one of them in, in the other unit so that we could compare. Um, so they, when they adjusted them so that there was a conversion so that we could compare if you measured two different things in different units. Larger than a yard, there are other units that we tend not to use anymore. One of them was a fathom. The fathom was used for navigating. A fathom was literally the shallowest water that most of your large ships could navigate through without bottoming out. Um, it was six feet. Well, they literally would take one of the taller sailors and throw them overboard. And if their head stuck up out of the water, it was too shallow to navigate through. Um, I'm hoping they pulled them back in, but who knows? It was different times. Yeah. Um, there was one a little bit longer than that that we're actually going to talk about a little bit. If my pen will work, maybe we will. Called a rod. One rod is five and a half or 5.5 yards or 16 and a half or 16.5 feet. A rod was actually a shepherd's tool. A shepherd had two tools that they used, um, the rod and a, a rod and a staff. The staff was that little hook, um, like you've ever seen the pictures of Little Bo Peep, she's got that little hook. That was for hooking the animal around the neck so you could detain them, destroy their wool, um, attend any medical needs or anything like that. The staff was a sapling, or the, sorry, the rod was a sapling tree. They take a sapling tree, they cut it off and debranch it, and that's what the rod was. It was a defensive weapon. It was for fighting off wild animals. You think about it, 16 and a half feet is pretty large, but if you're fighting off a wolf with nothing but a stick, you want a little bit of separation there. So how did he get used to, for measurement? Well, let's say that we both have some sheep, 
and our sheep go down, you know, my sheep go pastured out and yours go down and they get into the same valley. At the end of the day, I go to get my sheep and you come to get yours. Bless you. And I say, I had 12 sheep and you say you had 15 sheep and there's only 20 sheep in there. Well, one or both of us is lying, right? And there's probably going to be some big fights over it. And there was some big fights over it. For cattle and horses, they settled those fights by doing what? They branded them. They marked the animals. So it's pretty obvious whose was whose because of the marking. Sheep, the marking didn't work for a couple of reasons. The branding couldn't work. One is the wool grew out thick enough that you wouldn't be able to see the brand anyway. And the second one, I don't know why I find this one so humorous, is, well, wool is kind of flammable. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picturing the flaming sheep running for the river. But, um, yeah, I know, it's wrong. So anyway, um, tending sheep and, and goats and other animals like that that couldn't be branded was the beginning of land division. So we would literally find a, a landmark, like a big rock or something, and we would, from that landmark, we'd lay it out and say, okay, you're going to pasture your sheep over there. I'm going to pasture my sheep over here. And to make it fair, to measure it out from the rock, I'll put my rod on the ground. Then you take yours and lay it end to end. Then I'll grab mine and flip it and lay it end to end. And we'll count out, okay, it's 40 rods by 200 rods. And your pasture is 40 rods by 200 rods. We have the same size pasture, so it's fair. If you look at the legal description for land, um, land is still surveyed and described in rods. There's also a unit in there that was for surveying called chains. Um, those have kind of been wiped out into a modern surveying, but rods are still used. Bigger than rods, there were units like the furlong. Um, the furlong was kind of a, a funny one. It's, the furlong was actually the distance that a standard horse could run at full speed without resting. Is about an eighth of a mile. Only about 200 yards is how far a horse can run at full speed. Right. <clears throat> if you think about that, anything longer than that, you have to slow down to a trot. Um, we're going to go up then to a mile. Anybody remember how many feet are in a mile? Not everybody at once. 5,280 feet in a mile. Yards were 1,760. Now, I've heard a few different, I've seen a few different definitions for where a mile came from. The one that makes the most sense to me and sounds the most plausible is it came from the, the Greek and the Roman military. Um, the Greek prefix mili means a thousand or mill I should say means a thousand I'm um, like if you look at your taxes the mill rate is your price per thousand dollars of land value a 22 mill means if you're pro for every thousand dollars of value in your property you pay 22 dollars in taxes a mill or a mile was the distance that a Greek or Roman soldier marched in formation a thousand paces a pace was starting on your left foot going to your right foot and back to your left foot so marching in formation, each pace was about 5.28 feet. So 1,000 of them was 5,280 feet. That was a mile. So anyway, um, looking at those units, how would we convert between them? Well, if I give you, if I ask you four feet is how many inches, many of you can just blurt out it is what? 48 inches. We're used to doing that conversion because feet to inches is just times 12. But if we didn't know that one, if we didn't have that ready, what we could do is take our four feet, make it a fraction by putting it over one and using a conversion factor. If you remember when we talked about fractions, we had something like three fourths and we could multiply it by like five over five. 3 times 5 was 15, 4 times 5 was 20. 15 twentieths is equivalent to 3 fourths, even though it looks different. The reason it was equivalent was what we multiplied by here was 
one. We called it a unity fraction. And the technical definition of a unity fraction is the numerator is equal to the denominator. It is, 5 equals 5. So we're multiplying by 1, it changes the appearance, but not the value. Well, we're going to do the same thing over here. Only in the denominator of our unity fraction, we're going to put feet as a unit. And we're going from feet into inches. So I'll put inches in the numerator. One foot equals 12 inches, the equivalency between them. Now, as you look at that, it doesn't look like it equals one, but it really does. The numerator equals the denominator. 12 inches is equal to one foot. So it is equal to one. It's a unity fraction. Now, I should clarify, why did I have to put feet in the denominator? Well, because I want to get rid of feet. And in fractions, things can cross-cancel. Since the feet were on top here, I put them on bottom so that they will cross cancel out. So the feet will be gone. And now on top, I have 4 times 12 inches, which is 48 inches. And on bottom, I have 1 times 1, which is 1. So 48 inches over 1 is just 48 inches. Now, like I said, many of you know how to convert feet and inches enough that you don't need to use that process. But if I had something like 99 feet, and I asked you to convert it into rods, that's one that you probably don't have on the top of your head. So I'll take my 99 feet, and I'll put it over 1 to make it a fraction. In my unity fraction here, I might call it conversion factor. What needs to go on bottom? Feet, good. And what's going to go on top? Rods are the other unit I'm going to have. What's the relationship between rods and feet? Which one's bigger, first of all? Rods. One rod equals 16.5 feet. So the feet are going to cross cancel. I have 99 times one rod is 99 rods. On bottom, I have 1 times 16.5, which is 16.5. I'm going to divide it out. 99 rods divided by 16.5 is 6 rods. Any questions? Well, let's look at some other units. Before we talk about weight and mass, I need to clarify the difference between mass and weight. It's very subtle, and we tend to use them interchangeably, but there is an important difference between mass and weight. Mass is defined to be the amount of matter in an object. says how much how many particles how much stuff is in that object weight is the force of gravity on an object so it's how much gravity pulls on that object now when we talk about units of weight by the way what we're really talking about is units of force. Weight is nothing more than a force that is caused by gravity. So anyway, what the big difference between them is, is the way they are measured. Mass is measured with a balance. And what a balance is, is basically a really precise looking teeter-totter where we put the object we're trying to measure on one side, and we put known masses on the other side until it balances. And once it balances, 
whatever this mass is here in our known masses, the object we're measuring is equal to that mass. Weight or force is measured with a scale. A scale is usually based off of a spring. When a spring is stretched, a good spring, if you stretch it a certain distance, it'll take a force to stretch it that distance. Well, if you double the force, it'll double the distance it stretches it. If you triple the force, it triples the distance it stretches it. Up to a point, and the, the springs obviously have limits. So to measure something with a spring for weight, we have that spring, and then we have it set up so we can hook our object onto it down here somewhere. And we have something covering that spring, and then there's an indicator attached to it, and some sort of a numbered scale, hence the term scale. A scale is just an evenly spaced, metered set of numbers. So that's where the term scale comes from for measuring that. We put the object on there and it stretches it. As the spring stretches, the indicator moves. And the distance that indicator moves tells us the force of gravity or the weight uh, of that object. Now you might be looking at it and saying, well, both of them are kind of, you know, saying how heavy something is. Why is there a difference? Well, the difference is if you go to the moon, on the moon, gravity is one-sixth of what it is on Earth. So what it pulls on this in the spring is going to stretch one-sixth of what it would on Earth. So it has literally one-sixth of the weight. But if you look at here, gravity on the moon's being less. It's going to pull on this object less, but it's going to pull on our known object less as well. So it's still going to balance. It's still going to have the same mass. So mass is constant. And weight depends on gravity. On Earth, we tend to get a little sloppy and use the two interchangeably. Um, the force of gravity, or the amount of gravity, changes just slightly, very slightly, from the North Pole to the equator. Um, less than 10%. Somebody who weighs 200 pounds at the North Pole would weigh about 183 or 184 pounds at the equator. So there is a difference, but it's very small. So on Earth, we, since gravity is relatively constant, we tend to... Um, Use, you go back and forth and assume that it is a constant difference, even though it really isn't. For standard mass, the unit of mass of a standard system is something called the slug. You've probably heard this before, but didn't realize it was a measurement. You ever hear the expression, oh, there's a whole slug of them over there? Well, that's what it's referring to, a slug is that unit. A slug is about 36 pounds. We're not going to use the slug and mass in this course. Um, unless you go into engineering, you probably won't ever hear a slug used as a unit of measurement again. In engineering, though, it is very it is important in many cases to distinguish between mass and weight. In the standard system, we, we tend to focus on weight. And I'm going to go the opposite direction I did with length. We're going to start out with our largest unit of weight. What's the largest unit of weight you can think of in the standard system? The ton. How big is a ton? 2,000 pounds. When you think of a ton, you almost always think 2,000 pounds. And in this class, whenever you hear a ton, it will be 2,000 pounds. But I'm going to point out, that is actually what is called a net or a short ton, which implies 
that there is something called a gross or a long ton. That is 2,240 pounds. <clears throat> What's the difference? Well, if you look at your paycheck, um, if you work 40 hours in a week at $10 an hour, you have earned $400. That would be your gross pay. Do you get $400? No, they take out taxes and other stuff. You might get $270 or so. That would be your net pay. Same type of relationship here. The ton was originally used for buying and selling grain. So you couldn't put a ton of grain on a scale and in a pile, it would fall off the edges. So it had to be in a container. So the container that held a ton of grain was about 240 pounds. So a gross ton was with the container, 2,240 pounds. A net ton was just the grain of 2,000 pounds. Like I said, whenever you hear the word ton, 99.9999% of the time, they mean 2,000 pounds. In this class, we will never use the gross ton, the 2,240, but I wanted you to be aware that it is there because there are some, some applications out there that they do still use a gross ton. So smaller than a pound. By the way, the abbreviation for pound is LB. It would have made sense to use PD, but in the bookkeeping system for buying and selling grain, PD was already used as the abbreviation for paid. Kind of important not to mix the two up. So LB comes from the Latin word for pound, which is Libra. So that's where LB came from. So what's our next unit smaller than a pound? Ounces. How many ounces are in a pound? 16 ounces in a pound. Very good. There are units smaller than an ounce. The abbreviation for an ounce comes from the Latin word for ounce as well. And I can't remember what that is right now, but it's OZ. That's what they used. Um, smaller than an ounce. This one sounds metric, but it is not. It is called a dram. D-R-A-M, there were 16 drams in one ounce. Smaller than a dram, there were minims. And notice I'm not writing this one down even. Um, this is medical units. One, dram, one ounce was actually 60 minims. Drams and minims were originally used for your apothecary units, for medications. You might get prescribed an eighth of a dram of a medication, or you might be prescribed 10 minims of a medication. Also smaller than, than those is a grain. And for a grain, they usually go off of a pound, not an ounce. One pound contains 7,000 grains. A grain is actually so entrenched in medicine. Um, most of your powdered medications, like uh, well, anything powdered now, aspirin and stuff like that were measured out in grains. If you're a big hunter, of course, your, your gunpowder loads and stuff were measured out in grains. It was so ingrained in the medical fields that it was adopted into the metric system, but very sloppily. Um, we won't talk about it in this class, but if you're in like a, a math for health professionals type class, we would go through that conversion. It doesn't work out real well. So anyway, those are the units of weight in the standard system. A little bit of a side note. You don't need to write this down because you won't be tested on it. I want to talk about precious metals for just a second. You hear on the news all the time that the price of gold has reached $1,700 an ounce. They are not talking about the ounces that you and I are used to. You know, as we had mentioned with length, different rulers at different times declared, you know, their thumb and their foot to be the official inch and foot of the land. 
That happened in all different types of measurement, weight being one of them. So from one country or one region to the next, a pound might be slightly different than the other. Well, the center of the world for buying and selling precious metals was the island of Troy in the Mediterranean Sea. It was a very sheltered island and it kept people from having to come into the mainland. A lot of reasons why that island was very popular for trade and precious metals being one of them. So to this day, when precious metals are bought and sold, they are bought and sold in Troy measurement. One Troy pound is approximately 0.82 of our regular pound. So a Troy pound is smaller than our regular pound, than our pound. However, one Troy pound only contains 12 Troy ounces. So a Troy ounce is actually significantly larger than what we use for an ounce. We won't ever have to make those conversions, by the way, but like I said, it's nice to know them when you hear that stuff. Next, we want to talk about capacity and volume. Just like mass and weight, I want to make a distinction here. There is a difference between capacity and volume. It's not nearly as important as the difference between mass and weight, but it's there. Volume is calculated from length measurements. What does that mean? Well, that means it's cubic inches. A cubic inch is one inch by one inch by one inch, like that. It's that cube. Or cubic feet which obviously would be one foot by one foot by one foot in a cube. Capacity was standard size containers. I'm going to start out with capacity with one of our larger units. The gallon. A gallon was actually the amount that could be held in a standard men's hat. Now, we're not talking a cowboy hat. We're talking about the standard dress hat, like the derby style hats that was common in Europe. In fact, you may have heard the, the expression 10-gallon hat used for a cowboy hat. That was actually a sarcastic expression. Somebody walked in wearing a, a cowboy hat. Well, that's a 10-gallon hat there, meaning that's a really large hat was all that meant. It really isn't 10 gallons, of course. But that's where the gallon came from. Smaller than a gallon, what's the next unit that we use? A quart. Anybody know how many quarts are in a gallon? There are four quarts in a gallon, yes. The quart actually was derived from the gallon. The word quart is actually just an abbreviation of quarter gallon. So there's four of them in a gallon because it's a quarter. Smaller than a quart, we have the pint. The pint was actually a totally separate unit. Sizes were adjusted to make the pint fit in. It was actually just a standard size um, like cup or storage item. It was not a cup, I should say a glass or storage unit. You'd get a pint of beer, a pint of ale, a pint of whiskey. You'd store a pint of preserves. It was a standard size jar that was also used for serving liquids. There are two pints in one quart. Most of these um, quarts, pints, are what we consider to be wet measure. Because they were used for measuring fluids. I mean, even the hat, you could most hats you could dip out water and it would hold enough water, water long enough to measure it out. 
Um, the gallon was kind of, you know, wishy-washy being both wet and dry. But the next one, smaller than a pint, is the cup. How many cups in a pint? Two. In fact, there was a push to call it a half pint at one time and get rid of the name of the name cup. A cup is actually dry measure. It's for bakers, it's literally the amount of powder, either flour, sugar, or otherwise you can hold in your cup hand. Now, I have a friend who's a caterer that actually measures stuff like that. I've checked her. She dumps it into a cup and actually comes up to exact, almost exactly a cup every time. Just drop her on the drop her on the table there, right? Thanks. Have a good one. So I mean, that's where the cup comes from. It's dry measure. Smaller than a cup, we have one cup is equal to eight fluid ounces. A fluid ounce is literally the size, the volume of one ounce of water is where that came from. Now, it has not stayed true to that. It has been adjusted through the years. So if you took one, um, one ounce, weight ounce of water, and measured its size, it would not quite be exactly equal to a fluid ounce anymore. Smaller than a fluid ounce. There were tablespoons. Anybody know how many tablespoons are in a fluid ounce? I've always had a hard time remembering this one. It's two tablespoons in a fluid ounce. I always remember there's 16 tablespoons in a cup. Well, there's eight fluid ounces, so two times eight makes the 16. Smaller than a tablespoon, there is. A teaspoon, anybody remember how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? No avid bakers in here? There are three teaspoons in a tablespoon. Now, I'm going to give you a word of warning here. The abbreviation for a tablespoon. Sometimes it's a capital T. Sometimes a capital TSP. Sometimes small TBSP. You'll see I abbreviate it using a capital T and the BSP. For teaspoon... It's either small t or a small tsp. So you see, it's very easy to, to mistake that. Um, trust me when I say that if you're making chocolate chip cookies and it calls for three teaspoons of salt in the recipe and you read it wrong and put in three tablespoons of salt, I have not thrown away many cookies in my life, obviously. But there was no amount of milk that was going to make those cookies go down. So, now, the, the rest of the units that are smaller than a teaspoon are not ones we'll be tested on. I'm going to show you these last few just for fun. Because you've heard them, but probably did not realize that they were real measurements. One teaspoon is equivalent to two dashes a dash if you all like the salt shakers and, and pepper shakers we have you see the really big ones they had spice shakers that were big versions of that you would give it one quick tip and what came out that was your dashing to the shaker a dash of the shaker that's how much a dash was one dash contains three pinches so this is for powder again you just stick your fingers in, pinch them together, and however much flour or spice or whatever was between your fingers is what you put in the recipe. That was a pinch. One pinch. What's that? <laughs> One pinch was two smidgens. The smidgen is the one that always kind of grosses me out. If you stuck your finger into the, the powder or spice, or whatever stuck to it, you put in the recipe, that was a smidgen. So one of two things, either the cook with really sweaty hands has big smidgens or you get a picture of licking their finger and sticking it in. That one always kind of grossed me out a little bit. 
Um, you can actually buy measuring spoons for those yet. They are out there. They're real units of measure. We will not be testing that. That's it? Did they actually use those? Yeah. I've heard of it. I don't watch much televisions. Um, larger than a quart. Or larger than a gallon, I should say. Anybody know how many gallons are in a peck? A peck is two gallons. You ever hear Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers? Um, that's the peck. If you go to a strawberry patch, by the way, and buy fresh strawberries, those cardboard crates or the little wooden crates they have, those are either one or two pack crates. If they'll actually, you'll see them. If you look really closely, you'll see they're labeled that way. Bigger than a pack? A bushel? Is either four packs or eight gallons. Anybody know how many gallons are in a barrel? A lot of people want to say 50 or 55 gallons. 55 gallons is a drum. A barrel. Thirty one point five gallons. So a quarter barrel is seven and seven eighths gallons. There's also units like a hog's head and stuff like that in there. A keg is actually a, a barrel. Uh, most kegs are a keg is a generic term for any volume size for beer. So a keg can either be a quarter barrel or a half barrel usually. Okay, so those are our units of volume, length, weight, mass, and capacity for standard units. Next, I want to take a look at metric units. In the metric system, they have only one unit for each type of measurement. For length, the only unit they use a meter is slightly longer than the U.S. yard. This always used to annoy me. I used to think, why wasn't the meter, why didn't they just make a meter equal to a yard and save some hassle? It would have made things so much easier. Well, remember what I said about different rulers declaring their thumb and foot and whatever? Well, the metric system was developed in Switzerland in the 1880s and 1890s. The meter is actually equivalent to the Swiss yard. So the Swiss yard was a little bit longer than the, the U.S. yard or the British Imperial yard. For capacity, they use the unit of a liter. You might sometimes see that spelled L-I-T-R-E. It's the European European spelling of, of liter, and it is becoming popular in the U.S. now. They tend not to focus on weight in the metric system. The unit for weight or force in the metric system is a newton. We won't be using a newton in here. And then the unit for mass is a gram. What if they wanted to measure things that were significantly larger or smaller than any of these units? Well, they came up with prefixes. So we had the meter, the liter, or the gram. I'm not going to include the newton in there. A little bit of a side note, by the way, you see I abbreviate liter with a capital L because I was always told you had to. Um, the reason for that was it's really easy to confuse, is that 51 or is that five liters? Well, if you make that a capital L, it's clear that it's five liters. With modern type fonts, 
it's usually easier to distinguish between a one and an L, a small L. So now it is acceptable to use a small L for leaders. Back when I learned it in the late 1980s, ones and small Ls look the same on a lot of tape fonts. So if I want to go smaller, smaller than a standard unit, they use the prefix deci. Deci meant one-tenth. So you have a decimeter, deciliter, decigram. Centi was one one hundredth. So you'd have centimeters, centiliters, or centigrams. For a hundredth of a meter, a hundredth of a liter, a hundredth of a gram. Milli. We said mil was a thousand, so milli was one thousandth. So a millimeter was a thousandth of a meter. Milliliter was a thousandth of a liter. Milligram was a thousandth of a gram. Now, at that point, they stopped going every 10. They didn't go, you know, they went 10, 100, 1,000. They didn't go 10,000 and 100,000. They skipped those, and they went to one millionth. One millionth was the word micro. Now, the official abbreviation for micro is the Greek letter mu looks something like that. So technically, a micrometer is mu m, that's a millionth of a meter. A microliter, mu l, is a millionth of a liter. A microgram, a millionth of a gram. Now the medical fields were one of the first fields to start keyboarding everything into a computer. There is no mu key on a computer, uh, cube, uh, computer keyboard. And to avoid having to go into a menu to pull up a special character, they abbreviate it MC. So MCM in the med medical field is a micrometer. MCL is a microliter. And MCG is a microgram. So if you see that, that is micro. And of course, you keep going a billionth would be nano, and a trillionth would be pico, and you keep going. It's... They go down to 10 to the negative 24, if I remember right. Going larger. Than our standard unit. We have deca. Deca means 10. So DM was already decimeter, so they use DAM for decameter. D-A-L for decaliter, D-A-G for decagram. That was 10 meters or 10 liters or 10 grams. Hecto meant 100. So H-M was 100 meters, a hectometer. H-L was 100 liters. H-G was 100 grams, a hectogram. Kilo. Meant a thousand. KM was a kilometer, a thousand meters. KL was a kiloliter. KG was a kilogram, or a thousand grams. And again, they didn't do 10,000 or 100,000. They skipped up to a million, which is mega. Capital M, little m. Capital M was only used for mega, since little m was used for milli. Capital M, little m was a mega meter or a million meters. Capital M, oops, capital M, capital ML was a mega liter. Capital MG was a mega gram or a million grams. Now in practice, the standard units caught on. Milli caught on for pretty much every measurement. Micro got used in medical measurements. Kilo caught on in almost every measurement. The other ones didn't catch on. Deci, you almost never hear of deci. The only place I ever heard deci used is in the medical field for blood testing. If you have your cholesterol or your, let's say you have your blood sugar checked and it comes back as 90, that is 90 milligrams of blood glucose per deciliter of blood. Centiliters, 
you know, in the U.S., centimeter caught on because it's the closest thing to our standard inch. But if you go to Europe, millimeters are actually more com way more common than centimeters. Hecto and deca, you almost never hear of anymore. They never caught on. Um, in fact, even a kilo liter didn't really catch on. Um, a kilo liter is like 270 gallons. That's pretty big. Mega, the only one that really occurs outside of computers, of course, you got kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, those caught on. The only one that really caught on to mega is a megagram. And rather than referring to it as a million grams, they usually refer to one megagram as a thousand kilograms, and that is defined to be a metric ton. So that's the one unit that mega caught on for. It is a little bit, a few minutes past our break, so let's take our break here. It's 424, let's come back at 434, and we'll talk about converting in the metrics. Why not, right? That's what we're here for. So to do conversions, what you'll notice here in the metric system is on this chart, every time we move one notch, either direction, left or right, we're either multiplying by 10 or dividing by 10. Everything is powers of 10s. And when you multiply or divide by 10, what does it do to a number? It just moves the decimal point. That's all it does. So making conversions in the metric system is all about moving the decimal point. And I set up this chart that I did here very specifically so that it makes the conversions for us. For example, if we have 3.2 meters, and I need to convert that into centimeters, I am going from meters to centimeters. Here's meters, here is centimeters. To get from meters to centimeters, I'm moving one, two spots to the right. My decimal point here in 3.2 then has to move the same thing. One, two, I've got to fill in a zero there. Spots to the right. 3.2 meters is 320 centimeters. If I have 780 grams, and I want to go to kilograms. I am going from grams to kilograms. So I'm going from grams to kilograms. That's one, two, three spots to the left. So I have to take that number, 780. The decimal point is right here. And I have to move one, two, three spots to the left. That is 0.78, or 0 0.78 kilograms. All of those moves and all those conversions in the metric system are simply moving the decimal point like that. The next thing we want to talk about then is converting between Standard and metric. Now, when I convert between standard and metric, I have only one conversion memorized for each unit. For example, when it comes to length, I have memorized that one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. And I can use that equivalency to convert anything from, a sta from any standard length to any metric length. However, this textbook and my math lab do it in a very specific way. So if they had three feet and they want, you want to convert it into meters, in your book on page 576, there is a table with metric and standard units in it. Now we are converting from meters or from feet into meters. So I'm starting with feet, three feet over one. 
when I do my conversion factor, my equivalency fraction here, feet are going to go on bottom. My math lab in this textbook, in order to keep us from having to divide by ugly numbers, asks that you always put one in that denominator. So one foot equals. Now, if I look on 576, I don't believe there is actually one foot equals 3.05 meters. We're starting at 3.305 meters. So I would make that conversion now. The feet cancel out. Three times 0 0.305 is 0.915 meter. On bottom, one times one is one. So that is just 0.915 meters. Now, if I wanted to go the other way, let's say I have five meters and I want to know how many feet that is. I'm going to start out with five meters, put it over one. But I'm going to use a slightly different fraction here. I have meters on bottom, so they cancel out feet on top. Now, I could use one foot equals 0 0.305 meters, and I would get a correct answer, but the round off error would be just large enough that my math lab would count it wrong. So what they want you to do is if you look, let's see if we got one that's one meter equals feet. And they do. They have one meter equals 3.28 feet. One meter. Come on. One meter equals 3.28 feet. Again, they want us to have one in the denominator so we don't have to divide by anything. So it's all multiplying. So we have... The meters canceling out, 5 times 3.28 is going to be 16.4, yes, feet. So 5 meters is 16.4 feet. For capacity... Again, the only one I have memorized is that one gallon equals um, three point, I usually use 3.785, but I believe this textbook uses 3.79 liters. So I'll round it the same way they do, which again could make all of my conversions for me if I wanted to. But this, as I said, this textbook in my math lab wants you to have ones in the denominator so you're never dividing. So let's say I have three quarts, and I want to convert that into liters. So I take my three quarts, and I put it over one. And my conversion factors, quarts are going to go on bottom and liters on top. So I want a conversion that has one quart equal so many liters. The quarts are on bottom. If I look, one quart is 0.946. Liters. So the quarts cancel out. Three times 0.946 is 2.838 liters. Now, again, I'm going the other way. Let's say I have something that's 10 liters and I want to know how many quarts that is. I could use that same equivalency here, but to keep my math lab happy, we should use one that has one liter on bottom equal to so many quarts. So if we look on 576, we see one liter is 1.06 quarts. Liters cancel out. 10 times 1.06 is 10.6 quarts. What would have happened if I had used this conversion, same conversion up there? I'd have 10 liters over one times. My conversion factor here would be one quart equals 0.946 liters. The liters would still cancel out. 
I'd have 10 quarts on top over 0.946, and I would have to divide that out. Is 10.57 quarts. Notice that they are basically the same. They're just rounded a little bit different. If you happen to use this conversion or a conversion like that, and you get something like this, and my math lab counts it wrong, on the homework, if you go back and look at the solutions and you're within, you know, a couple of hundredths or even one-tenth, that's most likely what it is, is you use this conversion and they wanted you to use this one. Don't worry about it on the homework. I will fix that when I put it into Blackboard. If it does it on a quiz, write down the problem number and send me an email and let me know. And I will go in and I will actually change your score on your quiz. Because realistically, you can do it either way. My math lab just prefers it done with ones in the denominator. Well, some units that we don't think about converting is temperature. For temperature, we have two benchmarks that we go off of. Temperature at which water freezes, the temperature at which water boils. In the standard system, degrees Fahrenheit, what temperature does water freeze at? 32 degrees Fahrenheit, yes. What temperature does water boil at? 212. It's one we don't use much anymore. In our Celsius system, the, the metric system, what temperature does water boil at? Zero degrees Celsius. And what temperature does it boil at? One hundred degrees Celsius. There's one hundred degrees, one hundred divisions between water freezing and water boiling in the Celsius system. That's why they used to call it the centigrade system. Centi meaning 100, grade meaning division, 100 divisions. You will notice two things here. One is in the Celsius system, there's 100 degrees between freezing and boiling. In our Fahrenheit system, 212 minus 32 is 180. There's 180 degrees between freezing and boiling. So that means a degree Fahrenheit is much smaller than a degree Celsius. Of course, the other thing you'll see is the zero point is different. And that's where the problem comes for converting temperatures. Every other measurement we have has a common zero point. Zero meters equals zero feet equals zero inches, equals zero centimeters. Zero length is zero length, no matter what unit you're using. Zero gallons equals zero liters, equals zero quarts. Zero capacity is zero capacity. Now we tend to convert weight, standard weight, to metric mass. Zero pounds is zero kilograms. So zero is zero. But for temperature, there is not a common zero point. Because of that, we cannot just use a conversion factor. We actually have to use a conversion formula. So if we are going from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius, we have to take our Fahrenheit temperature and subtract 32 from it. And up here we had these numbers, 180 degrees and 100 degrees. The ratio of that, 100 over 180, is 5 ninths. So we take that times 5 ninths will give us our temperature in degrees Celsius. I always like to do human body temperature. 
What is human body temperature in degrees Fahrenheit? Ninety eight point six degrees. Let's convert that to degrees Celsius. So we put 98.6 in for F. And now it's just order of operations. In the parentheses, 98.6 minus 32 is 66.6. Then we have to multiply. 5 ninths times 66.6. .6. You don't have to use fractions. You just do 5 divided by 9 times 66.6 gives us 37. So 98.6 human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. If I want to go from degrees Celsius into degrees Fahrenheit, I just reverse the formula. Up here, we subtracted 32 multiplied by 5 ninths. Down here, we're going to take Celsius. We're going to divide by 5 ninths. Well, dividing by a fraction is multiplying by a decimal. So we're going to multiply by 9 fifths. And then we're going to add the 32. So let's say you are driving into work, and the radio announcer for some reason says, it's going to be 25 degrees Celsius today. A nice day, a cool day. Let's take a look. We put 25 in where C is, and again, it's order of operation. Nine fifths times 25 is 35. Plus 32 is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I would take that any day. In your notes, I want you to try to convert one temperature point. A little bit of exercise working with our negatives. Negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Convert that into degrees Celsius for me, quick. Negative 40, it is actually the one temperature that is the same in both scales. <clears throat> okay, last thing we want to look at is rates, units of rate or units of change. For example, if I were to tell you that I can throw a baseball at a rate of 90 feet per second, would you believe me that I can throw a ball that fast? No? Well, thanks. <laughs> you think of that on a baseball field, if I'm standing at first base, it's 90 feet to home plate. So I'd be throwing it to home plate and having the ball get there in one second. Well, let's see. What are we used to seeing speed expressed in? Miles per hour. Good. So 90 feet per second it really means 90 feet over one second. We have two separate units that are coming together here to make that rate. To convert them, we have to convert each unit separately. Here, we want to change feet into miles and seconds into hours. I'm going to do the feet first. Feet are on top here, so where do they need to go in my conversion factor? On bottom. And we're going from feet into miles, so we're going to put miles on top. One mile is 5,280 feet. The feet cancel out. Now in the numerator, we have miles. And in the denominator, we have seconds. Well, we want miles in the numerator, but we want hours in the denominator. So we have to get rid of seconds. Now, seconds are on bottom, so to get rid of them, I'm going to put them on top. Now, we don't have a direct conversion to hours, so I could go just seconds to minutes. One minute is 60 seconds. The seconds cancel out. 
I now have miles on top, which is what I want, but I have minutes on bottom. I need to change that into hours. So I'll put minutes on top, hours on bottom, one hour is 60 minutes. So my minutes have canceled out, and I now have miles on top, hours on bottom, just like I want. Now I'm going to multiply 90 times 1 mile times 60 times 60. That's 324,000 miles. On bottom, I have 1 times 5,280 times one, times one hour, it's 5,280 hours. Now, of course, I need to divide that out. 324,000 divided by 5,280 is what, 61.3636? That'll be miles per hour. Now, do you think I can throw that fast? No. If I warmed up, I could probably still hit this. Probably only throw about four or five of them my arm got sore. Nineties. Yeah, even outfielders are throwing 80 miles an hour. Yeah, it, I could probably still hit Anyway. Yeah, like I said, a few times and then if I kept throwing it would hurt. Let's look at some of the units. Um, some units you might have, like, I mean, you have a pump that is pumping at a rate of, oh, let's say it is going 3,000 gallons per hour. Well, we are used to pumps being rated in cubic feet per minute. CFM is that unit, cubic feet per minute. So let's take our 3,000 gallons, put it over one hour. We need to change gallons into cubic feet. Where are the gallons going to go on my conversion factor? Well, they're on top, so to cancel them out, I'm put gallons on bottom. I'm changing gallons into cubic feet. So cubic feet are gonna go on top. We haven't given this relationship yet. It's a relationship between volume and capacity, but one cubic foot is about 7.5 gallons. So the gallons will cross cancel out. What do I need to get rid of next? Hours. So where am I going to put it to get rid of it here? On top. And on bottom, I'm going to put minutes because I want to change my hours into minutes. One hour is 60 minutes. So the hours will cancel out. On top, I have 3,000 times one cubic foot times one. That is 3,000 cubic feet. On bottom. I have one times 7.5 times 60 minutes, which is 450 minutes. So now I take 3,000 divided by 450, I get 6.67, that is cubic feet per minute. By the way, most of your good pumps are between eight and 12 cubic feet per minute, so that's actually a little slow. Yes, sir. You could do 6.6 .6 with a repeating like that if you wanted to, yes. Most of the time in my math, I'm just going to ask you to round to either the 10th or the 100th. Okay, I think you guys have had enough for the night. There is no quiz because we had the test last class. So there's no quiz. There is a homework that is due for next Tuesday. And you should have your test so you can work on corrections. Test corrections are due by December, I don't remember the date, December 13th, I think, is the, the Wednesday, 14th, I think, is the Thursday. But anyway, 
make sure you're working on the corrections. So you guys have a great night. We will see you next Tuesday.